non-residential HERS verification. The material in this training was taken from two reference sources. Uh, the first is the non-residential compliance manual. It can be found at the Energy Commission's website at the link listed below. And the second is the residential reference appendices sections NA1 and NA2, which is the non-residential appendices 1 and non-residential appendices 2. Uh, they're both found in the same manual uh, and it can also be found on the Energy Commission's website uh, at the link listed below. The overall training goal is to gain an understanding of the non-residential HERS verification requirements. This training is broken up into seven different sections. And so each of the sections that we'll be covering will be starting with what is non-residential. Uh, section number two will be the HERS Rater responsibilities. Section three is required documentation. Section four, sampling. Section five, uh, duct leakage. Section six, low leakage air handler. And finally, section seven, water heating systems. So what is considered non-residential? So the California Building Code has different building types. Um, they consider them different occupancy groups, and they are lettered, such as groups A, B, E, F, H, M, R, S, and U. So you might be wondering, well, what do all those mean? Well, we'll look at that here in a second. Uh, for buildings that are directly or indirectly conditioned, they must meet all the mechanical, envelope, indoor, and outdoor lighting requirements of those standards. And we're particularly going to be looking at the mechanical requirements. Uh, buildings that are not directly or indirectly conditioned only need to meet the indoor and outdoor lighting requirements. Uh, so let's take a look at what those different occupancy groups consist of. So here we have table 1-1, and this gives us a, a breakdown of the differences between the non-residential standards and the residential standards. So there on the left side, uh, we have those types of buildings uh, that fall under the non-residential standards. Uh, and that does include some of the R groups, uh, which as you can see, if you look over to that residential side on the right, um, there are certain occupancy group Rs that are considered uh, residential. Uh, so that's the only one that uh, covers or it was included on both sides, uh, but there's some additional distinctions uh, that we'll look at here in a second that breaks up um, high rise versus low rise residential occupancies. So what is the difference between low rise and high rise residential buildings? So low rise will be comprised of multifamily buildings that have three or less habitable floors and all single family residences regardless of the number of stories. Uh, these must comply with the residential standards. Uh, high rise uh, residential is buildings that contain resi residential occupancies with four or more habitable floors and they will comply with the non-residential standards. So that is the, is the trigger there is how many habitable floors we have. Three or less is going to be low rise and that's going to be residential standards. Four or more is going to be high rise and will need to comply with the non-residential standards. So what are you going to be responsible for as the HERS Rater? Uh, you'll conduct the field verification and diagnostic testing of the air distribution ducts and or water heating systems, uh, transmitting all required data describing the results to a HERS provider data registry, uh, confirming the air distribution ducts conform to the design detailed on the building plans and specifications and the mechanical certificate of compliance approved by the enforcement agency for the building, and finally, verify the information on the certificates of installation and certificate of acceptance is consistent with the certificate of compliance. So in addition to the duct leakage testing and other visual inspections, uh, you will also need to verify that uh, the documentation is in order and that what was claimed on the certificate of compliance um, matches with those results found on the certificate of installation uh, and or certificate of acceptance. Now, because those other documents are not available for you in the registry, uh, the builder or subcontractor will need to make copies available to you of those various forms, certificate of compliance, certificate of installation, and the certificate of acceptance. And you need to have those documents prior to performing your field verification and diagnostic testing. Uh, so 
once you get those documents, you're going to want to make sure that the certificate of installation and certificate of acceptance have been completed as required and that the installer's diagnostic test results and other certificate of installation and certificate of acceptance information are consistent with the certificate of compliance. So you're going to need to check all three documents and make sure everything lines up uh, and is complete. So for non-residential, uh, we do have the uh, ability to utilize the sampling protocols. Uh, so just like on the, on the residential side, uh, the HERS rater will have the option to diagnostically test and field verify every uh, system or dwelling unit, or you can utilize the group sampling method. Uh, now what's different here for the non-res side is uh, the way we distinguish the type of inspection that you're doing. Uh, so if you're doing duct leakage testing, um, you will do every single zone space conditioning system um, or SCS. If you're doing the water heating measures, it's going to be based on the dwelling unit. So because of this, you will have two separate sample groups uh, that you'll be utilizing. So you might have a single dwelling and you're doing both a duct leakage test and uh, verifying some water heater measure measures. Um, each of those will go into a different sample group because of uh, the way that they're identified. Uh, so the registry will handle this. Um, you just want to take you know, your seven space conditioning systems and they'll go into a single group. Uh, and if you're using the or, uh, performing water heater uh, verification, you'll take seven dwelling units and put those into a group. Uh, so they will be handled separately within the uh, sample group functionality within the registry. Uh, but just be aware that they are handled uh, individually on the non-residential side, unlike the residential side where everything is done uh, within the single dwelling. So for the sampling process, um, it's going to be very similar to uh, what we have on the residential side. But again, as I mentioned, we're going to go through it uh, touch base to just to make sure that we kind of refresh you on this. So sampling is a process by which a HERS rater uh, will randomly select one space conditioning system or dwelling from a group of up to seven systems or dwelling. Uh, and SCS is for duct leakage, dwelling is for water heating. Uh, now, if that space conditioning system or dwelling passes, then the whole group is assumed to pass. Uh, the assumption is that if one SCS or dwelling unit passes, the other ones should be built to the same standards and should also pass. Uh, now, if that dwelling space conditioning system or dwelling cannot meet the sampling requirements, then the HERS raters will have to test 100% of the systems in that sample group. So for new construction only, uh, we do have a, a initial test. Um, this initial test is essentially the same as the model test that we see in the residential requirements. Uh, the HERS rater is required to diagnostically test and field verify either the first single zone space conditioning equipment unit of each newly constructed building or the first dwelling of each newly constructed building. Again, whether you're doing duct leakage testing or water heating measures. Uh, this initial test allows the builder to identify and correct any potential duct installation and ceiling flaws or practices uh, before other units are installed. Now, after that initial test is completed, uh, the builder or the HERS rater will uh, identify a group of up to seven individual uh, space conditioning systems or dwellings. Uh, and these will all come from the same building from which the sample will be selected. So you can't take two buildings. It might have two buildings in the same project, uh, but sampling has to stay within that building. Uh, the group will be closed prior to the selection of the sample that will be field verified and diagnostically tested. So we're going to be doing closed groups only. There is no open sample groups allowed. Um, and then the systems or dwellings in the designated group shall be located within the same enforcement agency jurisdiction and have the same installing contractor or subcontractor. So just to recap on this, it's just like residential closed sample groups, uh, up to seven groups, the group has to be closed before you perform any of your testing um, and they have to be located within the same enforcement agency and have the same installing contractor or subcontractor. Now for altered buildings, it's going to be a little bit different. 
Uh, those systems uh, or dwellings in the designated group do not have to be located within the same enforcement agency jurisdiction. However, the enforcement agency may require that a separate system from the sample group that is located within their jurisdiction be tested. Uh, now they do need to have the same installing contractor or subcontractor, uh, and then the installer can request that you create groups smaller than seven systems. So what happens if the installing, con installing contractors change mid-project? Uh, if the contractor changes, the builder must notify the rater, uh, and all sampling of the features the former subcontractor was responsible for must be closed. So any existing sample groups uh, have to be closed off, uh, and no additional units from the new contractor can be added to those uh, existing sample groups. Uh, any remaining systems completed by the former subcontractor are either individually tested or placed into a new sample group. And then any systems or dwellings that are completed by the new subcontractor shall be individually tested or included in a new sample group. What do we do if we have a failure? Uh, so you are uh, supposed to report all failures within the registry. The registry is able to collect those. Uh, it will create a revision for uh, the uh, input of additional test um, uh, results. So after you enter your failure, you'll be able to then add, add uh, in either additional failures or the final passing results. Um, so if the selected uh, SCS or dwelling fails, uh, the contractor will need to perform corrective action to remedy that failure, uh, and then you will need to retest uh, that system or dwelling uh, to ensure it does comply. In addition to retesting that initial failure, a second space conditioning system or dwelling in the group will be randomly selected for resampling. Uh, if this second sample passes, then the group will be deemed in compliance and the documents will be made available for the remaining sites in the group. Uh, if the second sample fails, then all remaining space conditioning systems or dwellings in the group will be tested to ensure the group complies. So you have to do 100% testing at that point. Uh, documents will not be issued until that space conditioning system or dwelling passes the test. Uh, so if you're unsure of these rules, these rules are all built into the registry. Uh, so uh, at any time, uh, if you enter any a failure, uh, the system will automatically require you to uh, randomly select an additional site or system for retesting. And if you have two failures, uh, then it will then require you to uh, perform 100% uh, testing on all of those sites that were in that sample group. When a single zone constant volume space conditioning system serving less than 5,000 square feet of floor area and having more than 25% of the system duct surface area located in unconditioned space, duct sealing is prescriptively required by section 140.4L for newly constructed buildings and by section 141.0B to C, D, and E for HVAC alterations. So let's take a little bit closer look at what that means. Uh, so let's break down those three criteria. So the first one here is uh, for a duct system that provides conditioned air to an occupiable space for a constant volume, single zone space conditioning system. So what is a constant volume, single zone space conditioning system? So constant volume means that the uh, system has a fan that runs at a constant speed. Now this does not mean that it mean that it only has a single speed it can still have you know high medium low but it's not going to uh, be variable uh, based on the load so it's going to be one speed uh, at a time it can't go you know low medium low medium high uh, it's going to have those two or three set speeds um, so single zone, what does that mean? So a zone is a space or group of spaces within a building with sufficiently similar comfort conditioning requirements. 
So a heating or cooling of that zone will be controlled by a single device, uh, most likely a thermostat, um, and those zones are all going to be single. So we oftentimes see this uh, on the residential side where you'll have the upstairs and downstairs of a home be in different zones um, because the, the way the stack effect works and heat rising upstairs, uh, you have different uh, comfort uh, needs. Um, so it's the same thing in, uh, in a uh, a non-residential building, more uh, where you have a, a warehouse space connected to office space. Um, so if you have a single system that is serving those two zones that are somewhat different, um, then that would not be a single zone. So we're looking at just the office space or just the warehouse space. Um, those would be single zones. Uh, the space conditioning system serves less than 5,000 square feet of conditioned floor area. So that one's pretty simple. Um, how many square feet is it? And it's got to be conditioned floor area. It's not going to be um, uh, indirectly conditioned. It's going to be that which is defined as conditioned floor area. And then finally, uh, the combined surface area of the ducts located in the following spaces is more than 25% of the total surface area of the entire duct system. So um, these spaces here are going to be unconditioned space. So outdoors obviously is not part of the conditioned space. Um, second one is in a space directly under a roof that has a U factor greater than the U factor of the ceiling or if the roof does not meet the requirements of section 140.3 A1B or it has fixed vents or openings to the outside or unconditioned spaces. So what this means is, you know, they want you to identify where is the thermal barrier, where is the insulation at. So if the ducts are on the unconditioned side of that thermal barrier or insulation, uh, then that's going to be in a space directly under a roof that meets this requirement and therefore then uh, it goes towards that 25%. And then the last two in an unconditioned crawl space or in other unconditioned spaces. So they want to know how much of this duct uh, is going to be in unconditioned space, which means that it's going to have a, a greater delta T between the air going inside the duct and the air surrounding it, um, which uh, just relates to how much of that heat energy is going to pass through that duct insulation. So you hear me talking a lot about conditioned, unconditioned space, indirectly conditioned space. So what is the, the difference? And um, as I mentioned, it's it's really where is that thermal envelope? Where is that thermal barrier at? And is the duct going to be on the conditioned space side of it or on the unconditioned space side? So let's look at this example here. So a plenum space below an insulated roof and above an uninsulated ceiling is an indirectly conditioned space. Uh, and the reasoning for this is there is less thermal resistance to the directly conditioned space below than to the ambient air outside. So in comparison, an attic below an uninsulated roof having insulation on the attic floor is an unconditioned space because there is less thermal resistance to the outside than across the insulated ceiling to the conditioned space below. So again, again, this is looking at that that thermal envelope, that thermal barrier, where the insulation is at and which side is the uh, space on. Is it on the side where the conditioned air is being uh, delivered or is it on the other side to where it's closer to uh, the outside uh, space? And so we also need to be able to, to determine the percentage of ducts in those unconditioned spaces. So if we remember back, uh, our target was more than 25% and it's of the duct surface area. So how do we determine that duct surface area? We first need to measure the length of the duct and then collect the circumference of the duct. And this is all the ducts that are located in unconditioned space. And so to find that surface area, we're gonna take the length of the duct, multiply that by the circumference, and that will give us the area. So they wanna know how much of that area is exposed to that unconditioned uh, space. We'll then divide the area outside the conditioned space by the total area to find the percentage. If that percentage is more than 25%, then it meets that requirement uh, for duct leakage testing. So example, we have a, a duct system where the total duct surface area is 1,000. Um, the duct surface area outside of the conditioned space is 300. And so we're gonna take 300, divide it by 1,000, and that's gonna give us 0.3. We're going to then multiply that by 100 to convert it into a percentage 
And so 0 0.3 times 100 is going to be 30%. 30% is more than 25%, so that means that this meets that requirement of having more than 25% uh, in unconditioned space, uh, and it will require duct leakage testing. Okay, so now let's take a look at the uh, required documentation that you um, need to have before you perform your duct leakage test. We touched on this briefly a little bit earlier, so now let's look at the specific documents that you'll need for duct leakage testing. So the first one that you're going to need is the Certificate of Compliance, the NRCC MEC-01E. Uh, this is the equivalent to the CF-1R in the residential standards. Uh, this is the design document, and specifically on this document, where you're going to be looking there is in Section B, um, the test description. You can see it's highlighted there in the red box, uh, and this is for the MEC 04A. And this basically, if that box is checked off, uh, then that indicates that a duct leakage test is uh, required for this particular system. So the next one is the certificate of installation, the NRCI MEC 01E. Uh, this would be equivalent to a CF2R in the residential standards, uh, and so this does the same thing. This is a certificate of installation. This gives you basic information about what was actually installed uh, on the project. And uh, what goes along with that, and this is new for uh, or different for the non-residential side, this is what we call the certificate of acceptance. Uh, this is the NRCA MEC 04A. Uh, and this would be most closely related to the CF2R. So what they've done here is they've taken the certificate of installation and they've separated that from the uh, test results uh, that we see on the CF2Rs on the residential side. So they've taken the, the installation and the testing and separated them into two separate documents on the non-res side. So we have the certificate of installation and then we have the certificate of acceptance and the certificate of acceptance is where the uh, results of the contractor's duct leakage test are documented. So you can see on here, the, the form here, it's got that information on there, duct leakage diagnostic test for new duct system or altered space conditioning system, uh, what have you. This is all going to be uh, those test results so you can see what method they used and what their their actual results were uh, before you go out and perform your test. Uh, and then last, we have the Certificate of Verification, uh, the NRCV uh, MEC 04A. Uh, this is the equivalent uh, of the CF3R for the residential standards. Uh, and this is going to be the only document that is going to be um, produced by the registry. So unlike the residential side where the 1Rs, the 2Rs, and the 3Rs are all uh, generated from the registry. Uh, Non-res has not gone that far yet, so the uh, the certificate of compliance, installation, and acceptance testing, those are all going to be uh, handwritten forms. They're not going to have registration numbers. They're going to be like the way we used to do it uh, on the on the non-res side. I mean, sorry, on the residential side. Um, so you need to collect those other documents, and then when you do your test, you're going to go into the registry, uh, create that uh, site, that dwelling, that system uh, in the registry, and then input your data for uh, the duct leakage test, and then the registry will produce this NRCV MECO 4A that you can then give back to uh, the contractor or the builder um, so they can have that for the local building official. Now let's look at some of the typical space conditioning system types that you'll see in these non-residential uh, buildings. Uh, so ducted systems will typically be attached to one of the following types, uh, either a package or a split AC. Uh, now these are both uh, similar types that you'll see on the residential side, um, but let's talk a little bit about what each of those are. So a, a package system uh, will have the furnace, evaporative coil, condensing coil, and compressor all contained in a single unit, and these will typically be located on the roof. Um, for a split AC, the air handler and evaporative coil are separate from the condensing coil and compressor. So you have two separate pieces of equipment. Um, usually the air handler and evaporative coil will be located inside the uh, dwelling um, or in the attic space um, where the 
condensing coil and compressor will be located either outside on the ground or uh, sometimes located up on the roof depending on the the type of structure um, but that's the main difference between those two and that's that's primarily what you're going to see um, and both of these system types will usually be 20 tons or less uh, and will have a dedicated fixed outdoor air supply so 20 tons that's significantly more than what you would see in a standard residential uh, those usually don't go above five tons um, so you may see uh, larger systems, but you'll still uh, be similar in, in types. Uh, now the testing criteria for these duct systems uh, falls into one of three categories. And these categories uh, are essentially the same as what we see on the residential side. Uh, it's just that the leakage criteria is a, a little bit different on the non-residential side. Um, so these uh, duct systems will fall into one of three categories, either be a sealed and tested new duct system, and this can be either for a new construction or uh, an alteration where it, an entirely new duct system uh, is installed, um, sealed and tested altered existing duct systems, uh, and then sealed and tested altered duct systems uh, that uh, do not comply with the standard leakage. So this is where that the smoke test uh, method comes into play. So let's take a look at each of these in a little more detail in the next uh, couple of slides. So for those new duct systems, uh, and this is primarily for new construction, um, the leakage rate uh, will not exceed 6% of the nominal air handler airflow rate. Uh, so for uh, the 2016 standards um, for residential, uh, that value drops from 6% to 5%. Um, whereas the non-res side has stayed at 6% of the nominal air handler airflow, airflow rate. Uh, now for altered duct systems, uh, an altered system can fall into a one of two categories. Uh, so it'll either be an entirely new or re complete replacement duct system or an altered duct system. Uh, now if you're not sure uh, what categories these fall under, what types of um, HVAC requirements uh, are, are based on what type of alteration it is. Uh, Energy Code ACE does have a trigger sheet. Uh, you can see there in the uh, at the bottom there, energycodeace.com. Um, they work closely with the California Energy Commission um, and have a lot of uh, good resource materials there. Um, so uh, be sure to check out Energy Code ACE um, and see what they have available for you. So that first category, the entirely new or complete replacement duct system, um, so that's going to be the same as what we saw for the new construction, a new duct system. It shall not exceed 6% of the nominal air, hand flow, air handler airflow, airflow rate. Um, so what is an entirely new or complete replacement duct system? So uh, that will be 75% new duct material. So this includes the actual duct work itself, uh, any Ys, uh, any register boots, um, any of the materials that make up that duct system, at least 75% of it has to be new. Um, and then that remaining 25% of the old system uh, may consist of reused parts uh, from the building's existing duct system. Um, if those reused parts are accessible and can be sealed to prevent leakage. So that's that's the key there. Um, as long as it's accessible so that the uh, installation contractor can get back in there, they can seal it up, then it's going to be deemed a entirely new or complete replacement duct system and it will have to test at 6% or less. Uh, now if that duct system has any part of it, doesn't matter how much, any part of that duct system is inaccessible, so it is not replaced, it's the old duct system left in place, you can't access it, so you can't seal it, then it's going to fall under the um, existing duct system. Um, so when extending an existing duct system, replacing an air handler, outdoor condensing unit of a split system or heat pump, cooling or heating coil, the system will need to meet one of the following requirements. So those are the things that will trigger this altered duct system uh, test requirement. Um, extending a, a duct system, replacing air handler, outdoor condensing unit of a split system or heat pump, cooling or heating coil, um, all of those will need to leak no more than 15% of the nominal air handler airflow rate. Um, 
So now if you can't hit that 15% because some of that system is inaccessible, it can't be sealed, um, then you can fall back on the what we call the smoke test. So a visual inspection and a smoke test. Uh, so now we do have uh, a couple of exemptions, just like we did on the residential side. Um, so an exemption to duct testing on an altered system is if the previously listed ducts um, uh, duct system has been documented to be, have been previously sealed and confirmed through field verification diagnostic testing. Well, how do we know that? What does this documented mean? Uh, it means that you're going to have a NRCV MEC-04. So the form that comes out of the registry means a HERS rater has been out there previously, they tested it, and it is uh, been shown as uh, sealed and passing. Uh, the second one there is if that existing duct system is constructed, insulated, or sealed with asbestos. Um, there's just a check mark on the thing um, claiming this exemption, and then you do not need to uh, verify that system. Uh, now we touched briefly on the smoke test. Um, now smoke test, we're going to go over that in detail, or we've already gone over that. You, you, we covered those in the duct leakage section of the training. Um, so if you uh, don't recall what the smoke test was, go back to that duct leakage section um, and you can review that and we, we cover the smoke test there. Um, for non-residential, uh, you have to be careful when conducting your smoke test um, if it has an active fire alarm system. You don't see these on the residential side, but on a non-residential you're going to have these integrated fire alarm systems. Um, and the smoke or theatrical fog can trigger that alarm system and that means the fire department's going to come out um, and it's going to be a big to-do. Um, the active fire, if you want to you know, prevent that from happening, the active fire alarm system must be placed in test mode prior to conducting your duct leakage smoke test. Um, so get with the, uh, the job site superintendent, make sure that they know that you need to do this smoke test and that it may affect the uh, smoke alarm. Get at them to put it into test mode, do your smoke test, and then make sure that they return it to normal operating, uh, normal operation after you're complete. Um, but yeah, save yourself a lot of hassle. Get that thing into test mode uh, before you do any kind of smoke testing. And as I briefly mentioned uh, on that smoke test, not only do we cover the, the smoke test requirements, but all of the equipment specifications and procedures for performing duct leakage testing are covered in the duct leakage module. Uh, so if you need a refresher on that, you can always go back to that uh, and, and review uh, those duct leakage requirements uh, in that module. An additional performance compliance credit is available for verified low leakage ducts if a qualified low leakage air handling unit is installed. Uh, now, because this is a performance credit, uh, it will only be indicated on the NRCC PRF01 form, which is the performance form, uh, and it will not be seen on any prescriptive compliance forms. Uh, the, now, the, the leakage target will remain the same at 6% unless it's otherwise stated on the NRCC PRF-01. So the, the compliance analyst that models this can select a value less than 6%. Um, so be sure that you uh, look at the PRF-01 uh, to verify what the target leakage rate is uh, if this credit is taken. Uh, now to qualify for this credit, the air handler that is installed must meet specific criteria and it has to be submitted to the CEC for approval. Uh, now approved equipment will be placed on the list and this list is maintained by the CEC and is available on the CEC's website. So we provide the link here uh, where that uh, list is stored uh, on the CEC's website. Uh, now as the HERS rater, uh, your responsibility is to collect the make and model number of the installed air handler and check it against the list of approved equipment. So you're going to open up that list and verify that the equipment that was installed uh, is on that list. Uh, and if it, now if that equipment is on the list, uh, then it passes and you're done. You just move forward with your duct leakage testing. Uh, if the equipment is not on the list, then you need to indicate it as a failure and this will be done in Section C of the NRCV MEC-04. And note that it is not on the approved list. 
Uh, now this will give the feedback to the installing contractor um, that the equipment is not on the approved list and that they either need to change it out for an approved piece of equipment or they'll have to rerun uh, the energy calculations uh, without that low leakage uh, air handler credit. Domestic hot water distribution systems will need to be verified when the NRCI PLB21H or NRCI PLB22H are indicated as required on the NRCC PLB01E in Section C. Uh, so here at the bottom, we've got a close-up of Section C. Uh, we'll look at the full form here in a second. Uh, but you can see that down there in Section C, it has different uh, items checked off. And in the red box there, uh, those are the two. If the yes column is checked, uh, then uh, HERS verification of either of those measures uh, will need to be uh, done for the DHW systems. Uh, so here is the NRCC PLB01, the Certificate of Compliance, um, and this is most like the, uh, the CF1R on the residential side. Uh, and you can see this is the full length form here and down at the bottom is Section C. Uh, and if either of those is uh, checked off or highlighted, uh, then you'll know that uh, HERS verification of either the PLB21 or 22 uh, is required. Uh, so we also have the NRCI uh, certificate of installation for the PLB21 and 22. Uh, this is the equivalent to the CF2R um, and uh, the different forms depend on whether it is uh, dwelling specific or um, for the whole building. So that's the difference between the 21 and the 22. Uh, and just like the other ones, we have our certificate of verification uh, for each of the 21 and 22. Um, and uh, so this form, uh, just like we saw with the duct leakage, uh, the certificate of verification comes out of the registry. Uh, the other forms, certificate of compliance and certificate of installation, uh, those will be uh, filled out by hand. Uh, you'll need to collect those prior to performing your inspection. Um, and then uh, you'll enter your test results uh, into the registry on either the PLB 21 or 22. Uh, and then the registry will generate that registered certified document uh, so that you can give that back to the uh, building department or to the builder uh, so they have that available for the building department. Uh, so the PLB 21 and 22 have several different uh, possible verifications that you could perform and those will be identified on the, um, the certificate of installation. Uh, and so the procedures for performing each of those verifications uh, was already covered in the water heating systems module. Uh, but we're just going to go here really quick and uh, go through what sections cover what on that form uh, and what verifications they are. So uh, on the PLB 21 in section D, that's going to cover um, the, the requirements for all domestic central hot water systems. Um, so it's kind of a catch-all for, for everything. Uh, when we drop down to Section E, uh, that's going to be for recirculation systems with a temperature modulation control. Uh, section F is recirc systems with continuous monitoring systems. Section G is for demand recirculating requirements. Uh, section H is for non-demand control recirc systems. Uh, and then Section I is for HERS verified multiple recirculation loops for DHW systems serving multiple dwelling units. Uh, now let's move into the PLB 22 uh, and Section E again is kind of that catch all uh, mandatory measures for all uh, domestic hot water distribution systems. And then we get down into the specific ones. Uh, so Section F is for the pipe insulation credit. Uh, section G is for the central parallel piping. Section H, compact hot water distribution system. Section I, demand recirculation with a manual control. And finally, Section J, demand recirculation with a sensor control. Again, all of the uh, requirements for performing these verifications were covered in the water heating section. Uh, so if you'd like a refresher, you can go back up and review that section again. So that does bring us to the end of our training. Uh, we hope that you were able to achieve your overall training goal of gaining an understanding of the non-residential HERS verification requirements. 
Should you have any additional questions or comments, uh, as always, please feel free to reach out to us through the uh, LMS system uh, or directly by email or phone call to the main office.